Good morning, everyone. This is Penny from Wisconsin Land and Water, and thank you for joining us today for the Forestry and Climate Change webinar. And today our presenters are going to be Stephen Handler from the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science and Andy Hart from NRCS. I'm going to turn it over to Stephen. Hey, can you hear me okay, Penny? Yes, I can. Go ahead. Perfect. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining the webinar today. I'm going to be talking for the first chunk uh, of the webinar and then we'll turn it over to Andy uh, for some closing comments on, on NRCS practices. Um, and so I, I appreciate y'all, you know, putting aside whatever else is, is on your desktops or on your, uh, your to-do list uh, for an hour to learn about maybe something new and interesting. Um, and that is uh, climate change and Wisconsin's woods and specifically how it might, um, how some new tools and resources can help you do your jobs and connect with landowners on this issue. So like Penny mentioned, um, I work for a group called the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science or NIACS. We're based in Houghton, Michigan. Um, but we have a, a footprint that covers all of the Midwest and also all of the New England states as well. So we have a 20 state footprint that follows the Forest Service regional boundaries, if you're familiar with that. Um, I'm a Forest Service employee. I work for the Northern Research Station of the Forest Service. But NIACS is actually bigger than the Forest Service. We are a chartered institute that has um, a special mandate, and that is to provide real world and practical help to land managers on climate change adaptation and carbon management. Um, and the way we came about basically is that we have a, a steering group or a board of directors of organizations that have said that this kind of service is really necessary for landowners and land managers. Um, and so the, you know, the groups you see in the logos there on the screen are each organizations on our steering group or board of directors. Um, and this includes all three branches of the forest service, um, including uh, national forest, state and private, uh, and research. I should also mention that NIACS, uh, we direct one of the USDA climate hubs. Um, so many of you are NRCS employees, so you might have heard of the USDA climate hubs. NIACS runs the Northern Forests Climate Hub, uh, and we can talk about that more if you have questions. But that's a little bit about who we are and what we're all about. Basically, I tell people we're like a climate change help desk. Uh, for land managers all across the, the region. And that means whether you're uh, working for a federal agency, a county, a state, a tribe, whether you're a consulting forester or an interested landowner, our group NIACS is um, part of our mission is, is working with you. Uh, and so why are we here? Why do we care about climate change? Um, and this is often uh, uh, the way I start out presentations. I don't think I probably have to beat this horse too much uh, with you all since you've chosen to participate. But the message is that forests and our ecosystems uh, across the Midwest, they provide essential values for us, whether it's a, a legacy you're passing on to your kids, uh, whether it's wildlife habitat and ecosystem services like clean water provisioning or, or outdoor places to to hunt and fish and do other kinds of recreation, or whether you care about the economic engine that forests provide for landowners and for industry in our region. We know that the healthy forests provide all of these values. Um, and some of them are gonna be more or less important to different landowners. We don't have to argue about which of these values are, are most important. Um, but the point is that a changing climate has very real potential to to challenge the ability of our forests to continue providing these values uh, to our landowners um, and to our citizens. And so regardless of, of what values you think are most important, climate change is, is meaningful to you because it's going to have serious consequences. Um, and this is new information I just got from Paige Fisher, a researcher at the University of Michigan. This is preliminary survey data, data from uh, over a thousand landowners, uh, I guess over 1,200 landowners responded to her. She was surveying 
forest landowners in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan that own 10 acres of land or more. So these are your clients. These are people you work with uh, and meet with. Um, and the responses here are pretty, pretty overwhelming that these landowners uh, who are motivated enough to send back a survey um, agree overwhelmingly that yes, the climate is changing, that yes, human activities contribute, and that forestry has a role, both as a uh, a solution and and um, and a an, a player uh, in the in the cause of climate in the Earth's climate climate cycle. Um, so whether or not you guys are are hearing this from people that you're talking to uh, directly, there's a strong chance that that landowners are ahead of the curve on this and that are aware that they are aware of what's going on and they're looking for information. So I, I won't have time to cover everything under the sun on climate change and what it means for forests today. If you're looking for a deep dive, um, I'd be happy to share hard copies or you can go get uh, PDF copies of this forest ecosystem vulnerability assessment. This is for northern Wisconsin forests uh, and specifically looks at how climate change um, might make some forests uh, more or less vulnerable over the next century. This is not about making recommendations about what you need to do to manage forests, but it's supposed to be a common platform, kind of our, our best available information um, that we have on climate change impacts. Uh, and this was produced, you know, not just with a handful of scientists in a lab um, looking at models, uh, but we put uh, this information to work in front of a big panel of federal land managers, state land managers, tribes, forest industry. We got everyone around the same table asking questions, kicking the tires, and drawing conclusions together about what's what's most at risk and what's likely to change uh, in northern Wisconsin's forests over the next hundred years. You all in Wisconsin, uh, you are lucky to have a group like Wiki, the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts. If you're not familiar with Wiki, I definitely encourage you to go to their website. They have working groups on particular topics like forestry. There's a forestry working group that's been very active. Um, they put out really useful handouts and materials like this that can be useful to share with landowners uh, or your coworkers. Um, it's a resource to get climate change information for the state of Wisconsin. So you can pull up specific uh, things that you might be looking for. Uh, and also if you're dealing with ecosystems other than forests, uh, there is a really nice series of natural community vulnerability assessments on here uh, that cover all of the non-forested uh, ecosystems in the state. Um, so it's a really nice resource. So uh, that was just a little bit of a preamble. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, number one, I'm going to do a quick recap of climate change, uh, just in case this is new for some of you. So we'll talk a little bit about um, recent observations in Wisconsin and what that can tell us. Uh, we'll spend a little time on specifically forest impacts. So how do these climate change trends uh, have implications for forests across the state of Wisconsin. We'll talk a little bit about adaptation and how to prepare. Um, and that'll include Andy's section on how NRCS tools and programs can help prepare. Uh, and then I hope we save time for um, questions and discussion. Now, like Penny said, uh, you all can type questions into the chat box as we go, uh, or if you're not shy, just speak up and, and interrupt me. I would love to have questions as we go. Don't You don't have to save them for the end. Okay, so first, uh, I wanna set the stage here with uh, an important distinction, and that is the difference between climate and weather. And I think this is something that um, is really easy to overlook, uh, and it's important to just to kinda set this firmly in our minds as we as we get talking about this subject. So uh, I'm gonna start by showing um, a map of last February, February 2019. So if you roll back 
uh, your memories to last February. This is a snapshot of um, monthly departure from normal across the whole globe last February. Um, and a couple of things might stand out to you. Uh, number one, most of the planet is pink, right? So most of the planet was a little bit warmer than the long-term average. Uh, but man, the uh, upper Midwest uh, and Canada in the U.S., we were the cold hot spot, or cold hot spot, that's a nice term. Um, we were the cold spot uh, across the whole planet. Um, and you may remember this about last February. It was a cold and snowy February. Um, now, what does this tell us about climate change? Unfortunately, this doesn't tell us anything about climate change. This is just one snapshot in time. Even if we look at an average for a month, that is just weather. That's random chance that we know uh, how this goes in Wisconsin. The next month could bring something totally different. Um, so this is, you know, whether you're looking at a day, a week, a month, even a year, uh, that's really in the realm of weather and random chance. So let's roll back the curtain a little further. Okay, now we're looking at just the state of Wisconsin. Uh, the pink line shows average temperature for the month of February for the last 20 years or so. Okay, so this pink zigzag is the last two decades of Wisconsin Februaries. And what do you notice? Kind of like, kind of like what we mentioned. We've got this huge seesaw uh, between warm and cold Februaries. There's a lot of change one year to the next. We see the cold years, um, 2013, 2014, polar vortex years, um, followed by warm years and preceded by warm years. Um, and so again, the point is, even if we're looking at a decade or more of, in this case, temperature records, there's still so much randomness and year-to-year -year change here that it doesn't tell us anything meaningful about the long term. Even when we're looking at 20 years, this is still mostly telling us a story of unpredictability and year-to-year -year variation. So this is still weather, not climate. Uh, and so I use the analogy of a, a roulette wheel. Um, so you know, at the start of every February in Wisconsin, we're spinning that roulette wheel. Uh, and if you land on black, you're getting a warmer than average February. And if you land on red, you're getting a colder than average February. Um, and that's kind of the way we operate. That's kind of the way weather everywhere operates. Now, roll back the curtain all the way uh, to the late 1800s. Um, and then this is the full record of weather station data we have for Februarys across the state of Wisconsin uh, for the last 120 years or so. Um, and a couple of things, what, what this allows us to do. Uh, number one, because we have uh, enough time, we can start to talk about a meaningful average. Uh, and an average of weather is the climate. We look for a minimum of 30 years of information before we can say anything about climate as opposed to weather. Now we've got 120 years, so we can say that gray line is our average temperature for February, about 16 and a half degrees Fahrenheit for the whole month of February for the whole state of Wisconsin. Um, so this is our climate. Uh, now that we've got enough information to put together a whole picture. The other thing that having uh, enough information allows us to do is to talk about trends that are meaningful and not just driven by year-to-year -year variability. Um, and so this blue line, this is our long-term trend of February temperatures. And I don't know if you can read that text on the screen, but that trend is 0.5 Fahrenheit per decade, warming. Uh, and that doesn't sound like a lot. It's not a huge number, 0.5 Fahrenheit per decade. But the idea is once you start stacking together, decade after decade after decade after decade, now we're talking over 100 years, we've got over five degrees Fahrenheit warming over this period of time. 
uh, and that is an astonishing rate of change. Um, it's very fast. Uh, February is actually uh, one of the months that is warming the fastest, uh, and it's not just in Wisconsin, it's uh, across the Midwest, across northern latitudes all around the world. Um, and so what, what do we know now? Our assumption about what is normal in Wisconsin is changing. Right? We used to have this 50-50 chance of a warm, Wisconsin, warm February or cold February. But now as long as this trend is operating, we are basically adding more black tiles to our roulette wheel. We're changing the odds of what we're likely to get. And that's not to say we're not going to continue to get cold conditions. Right? We still will get these polar vortex outbreaks. Uh, even last year um, was colder than average February. But it's more and more likely that we're getting these warm Februarys and becoming much more common as this trend continues. And so that is climate change in a nutshell, long-term change in conditions uh, that is, you know, statistically meaningful. So let's break this down a little longer, a little further. Um, I, I was talking about February earlier. Um, it's not just the month of February, really the whole winter season December, January, February is really where the most action uh, is happening in terms of warming. This is the season that is warming faster than any other season across the year. Um, if you break it down geographically in Wisconsin, uh, there's a little bit of variation, but most of the state has seen um, between four and five degrees warming uh, just in the last 70 years, right? So we've seen most of that warming happening um, in more recent decades. Uh, and it's statistically significant across the whole state of Wisconsin. That's what those asterisks tell you. Um, on the other hand, if you look at other parts of the year, other seasons, we're not seeing the same rate of warming. Um, so looking at summer maximum temperatures, for example. Okay, so summer, uh, you know, hottest conditions in the summer. Um, and it's it, it's pretty muted across the whole state. Some areas are not changing at all. Some areas are just seeing slight increases. Um, so winter is really the season uh, uh, that is driving things, driving the rate of change here uh, in Wisconsin. That's a consistent story around the whole Midwest. Um, winter is the season that's changing the fastest and it's warming the fastest. If you look at precipitation, um, we have similar information uh, for precipitation going back 120 years. This is showing you the, uh, 1950 and onward. And the storyline is that winters have gotten quite a bit warmer um, in Wisconsin, uh, particularly in southern Wisconsin. And summertime, we're starting to see a north-south split where southern Wisconsin is continuing to get quite a bit wetter in the summertime, northern Wisconsin has actually seen a slight amount of drying over the same time. Um, and so this is this is kind of an anomaly. Summer is the season where uh, we get this, this split and this difference between northern and southern Wisconsin. So again, this is our long-term trend of climate change. Uh, and it's not just how much rain you get across the whole year, it's how it's delivered. Um, and another really important storyline of climate change in Wisconsin is that heavy precipitation is becoming more and more frequent. So when I talk to people about the two main storylines of climate change, um, I talk about warmer winters and I talk about this one, heavy precipitation. This is just a, a figures from the three Northwood states showing rain events of three inches or more. And this cuts off um, on the first decade of the 2000s. So this doesn't show anything in the last nine years that Wisconsin has experienced. And, and we know there have been several large rain events that have hit Wisconsin just in the past handful of years. So this trend is definitely continuing. Um, this is a, a shot from the 2016 storm uh, that hit Northern Wisconsin. Um, and caused tremendous damage uh, across several counties uh, in the northern part of the state. 
And even if we didn't have thermometers or rain gauges, uh, there are many other lines of evidence to let us know that the climate is changing and that plants and animals are beginning to respond. So whether you're looking at flowering dates, migration dates, or, or leaf out dates, um, there's a lot of evidence to tell us that ecosystems are beginning to respond to these changes. So folks who have been measuring, say, um, leaf out dates uh, have already documented about a, a week earlier onset of spring uh, over the last half century. Uh, and the USDA has had to redraw their hardiness zone maps for our whole region. Uh, and this is important, you know, if you're wondering whether or not to plant that plum tree in your backyard. Um, you know, as, as recently as 1990, um, we had this cold, cold zone of negative 35 to negative 40 in Wisconsin, that zone has now disappeared uh, from the state. And you see the advance of these warmer hardiness zones becoming more common uh, across more of the state. So again, it's kind of resetting the rules about what can grow and what can tolerate our winters when our winters are becoming more mild. Okay, that was my quick and dirty climate change recap, a couple of the major trends that are already out there for Wisconsin. So if, if you have questions about that, chime in now or, or ask uh, questions in the, in the chat screen. Steven, okay. I have a question about the hardiness zones actually. Yeah. Um, so those just changed this year and um, how how often is something like this going to uh, fluctuate? I guess it depends on the um, the amount of climate change. So we should be looking at considering how these these shifts, and we need to consider that when we're planting and stuff like that. So I guess my question is is um, how long will these be good for uh, these types of zones? You think they're going to change like extremely fast and keep shifting, or or not? Um, I don't think they're going to update them every year because the whole point is that you need, you know, you need to demonstrate a meaningful trend um, before you before you can say something definite about the climate. Um, so I'd be surprised if they update these, you know, very frequently. I would expect that these maps will probably hold for five or ten years before they revisit them because they probably want to be conservative. All right, thanks, excellent. So um, what do we expect and, and what specifically to future climate change, what could that mean for forests in Wisconsin? Um, like I mentioned, when we did that vulnerability assessment, uh, we had participants from a bunch of different agencies and backgrounds around the same table talking about the different ways that forests could be affected by climate change and, and something that people kept coming back to is that you know warmer winters or a heavy rainstorm here or there isolated events are, are not gonna kill uh, or, or threaten our forests all at once right so climate change isn't gonna be like all of a sudden uh, you know a sweeping devastation across the landscape um, so you can kind of take that picture out of your heads instead uh, we like to use this image that actually the U.S. military uses when it talks about climate change, and that is this idea of a threat multiplier, uh, right? So it can be this thing that starts to encourage new interactions or more damaging interactions. It can be like, uh, you know, all of a sudden a bowling ball hits the head pin, and then those pins start to bounce uh, and, and affect each other. Um, and so that's kind of the idea of, of climate change here. Um, and when we kept talking through this uh, with the group of experts, these were some of the, um, the headlines that kept rising to the surface, different ways that climate change could affect our forests. So I'll, I'll give you a sec to look at this list. We got a longer growing season, CO2 fertilization, more drought risk, extreme weather events, less frozen ground, potential for increased fire risk, species range changes, and increased stressors. Um, 
Now, I told you, I don't have time to go over, uh, you know, the whole story, uh, soup to nuts of, of climate change on this webinar. So this is a chance for some audience participation. I want to hear from you all. What are you most interested in? Is there something on this list that you want to hear more about or maybe that surprises you, you haven't seen before? Uh, I'm only going to cover a couple of these. So this is your chance to tell me what you're interested in. And we'll let Andy moderate the, uh, the chat screen. Don't be shy, people. You can either unmute yourself and say something or please send something into the chat line. So that'll help Stephen with his um, topics that he's going to cover. We have one that is, uh, what is CO2? Um, oh, shoot. Message just appeared. Uh, what is the CO2? What is CO2 fertilization? Okay. Somebody always asks about that one. It's kind of, yeah, it's mysterious. Okay. So let's talk about this one. Um, CO2 fertilization, if you, you know, go back to your plant physiology class well, way back in the day. Um, we're looking at a picture here of cross section of a leaf. Uh, and you guys all remember trees and, and other plants, right? We're absorbing CO2 passively from the atmosphere. Um, and that is funneled into our photosynthetic pathway. And that carbon is stored as sugar and then biomass uh, for plants. So this is what helps trees grow. Uh, and do all their necessary metabolism. And so the idea is, as we have increased the atmospheric concentration of CO2 uh, over the past several decades, we're basically growing trees in an enriched food environment, right? So it's like old country buffet, just floating around in the atmosphere. All of this extra food that we don't have to work that hard to get. Um, and they've demonstrated that trees can take advantage of this extra CO2. So they've done experiments uh, across the whole country. One station in Wisconsin looked at uh, an aspen forest and they created these huge outdoor chambers where they um, surrounded an aspen forest and pumped it full of excess CO2 to see what would happen. And they watched this aspen stand for 12 years. And they they measured uh, an increase in growth. The, the aspen in the chamber put on 25% more biomass than the aspen outside of the chamber. So this is a real benefit if you are interested in forest growth and biomass, um, that trees can take advantage of this extra CO2. Uh, and also there's this idea that having more CO2 freely available will also help forests be more efficient with their water because when they start to feel a little drought stress, they start to feel a little pinched for water, they can close their leaf pores um, and that prevents them from losing water vapor, but they have already accumulated enough CO2 that they can keep their metabolism running during that period of drought stress. Um, so that's the potential benefit if you have excess CO2 in the air. Now, this is not just a uh, runaway gravy train into paradise. When they did these experiments, they were pumping, uh, you know, double our current atmospheric level of CO2 in there. Um, and there's this idea that uh, other things are limiting to plant growth other than just CO2. So eventually you're going to hit some other nutrient that's limiting or water. Um, and there's also some interesting research from that same aspen forest in Wisconsin that um, forest pests can actually key into this increase in growth and start consuming more of the uh, leaves that these trees are putting on. And we don't know exactly what it is yet that cues the insects to eat more of these, these leaves, um, but there's a potential there that pests are going to try to play catch up as the trees are growing faster. 
So that's a little bit about CO2 fertilization. It is a potential benefit, um, but I, I guess you got to take it with a little grain of salt also. Um, now, I believe we also talked about um, species range shifts. That was the other question, and I should um, I should get to this because uh, this is another one that often comes up. It's often something landowners are asking about or already tinkering with on their own. Maybe you all have gotten questions about this from landowners. What does climate change mean? Can I start planting, um, you know, uh, bald cypress and eucalyptus uh, on my property in northern Wisconsin? Um, so what information do we have about tree species and climate change? Um, I'm showing you a picture from a tool that we call the Climate Change Tree Atlas. And I'm showing you the website there. If you're not familiar with the Tree Atlas, uh, it's a forest service tool. I would definitely encourage you to, to check out this site. What the Tree Atlas does is it allows you to draw maps of the future that show potential suitable habitat for a tree species under a range of climate change futures. So how this works is you've got current aspen distribution on the left. This is from FIA data. Um, and so we know where aspen lives right now across its whole range. Darker colors means there's more aspen there. So you can kind of see the, the hot spots of aspen across the Northwoods. And we know there's a whole bunch of things that control why does aspen live where it does right now. There are soil factors. There are land use factors, there are climate factors, um, things like, you know, landscape features like slope and elevation and aspect can control tree species distribution. About half of the, and so this, this model looks at 40 different variables that control, or that could control why does a tree live where it does. About half of those variables are soil related. Uh, and maybe seven or eight of them are climate related. Like, you know, what's the minimum temperature you get across the whole year? How much rain do you get during the growing season? Uh, what's the summertime maximum temperature? Things like that that could limit or allow a tree to live where it does. And so what the tree atlas will allow you to do then is take out the current information about the climate and plug in future projections of the climate and you redraw that map, assuming that all the relationships are still the same. So if a tree needs a certain kind of soil right now, we assume it still needs that kind of soil in the future. Or if it has a current temperature or precipitation threshold right now, we assume it's still gonna have those limits in the future too. And so you can redraw these maps and look at, well, where's potential growing conditions going to exist for this species in the future? And so for Aspen, I'm showing you the example here. Under a mild climate change scenario, this is our best case climate scenario for the end of the century. There's still a lot of suitable habitat for Aspen across Northern Wisconsin uh, and across the rest of the region. Under a high climate change scenario, um, this is kind of business as usual climate change there's still some suitable habitat for Aspen in northern Wisconsin and the western UP and northern Minnesota. Uh, but it's clearly reduced, right? It's not, not as ideal suitable habitat. And so what this tells you is not that Aspen is all going to fall over and burst into flames all at once. Uh, but what it does tell you is Aspen that is remaining, especially maybe in these yellow areas, Aspen that is remaining here is going to be growing further outside its comfort zone, uh, right? It may be exposed to more stress because it's growing outside of its preferred range. Um, other species tell a different story, right? So take a more southerly distributed species like white oak that exists south of the tension zone now in Wisconsin. And again, you run the statistical analysis and you figure out which of those 40 variables control this right now and you redraw them under a mild or a climate or a, a more extreme climate scenario, and you see expanding suitable habitat in northern Wisconsin by the end of the century. 
Now, this is not a prediction that white oak is going to be there. It's going to take either, you know, human decisions to plant uh, or a bunch of super caffeinated squirrels marching those acorns northward. Uh, but what it does tell you is if a white oak is there at the end of the century, there will be suitable habitat, suitable growing conditions for it. Uh, we have summary handouts that give you a, a kind of a quick and dirty description of what the climate models say for all of these tree species. Um, and that's at our, our website, forestadaptation.org. Uh, we have it for a couple different regions in Wisconsin, northern and southern, as well as a separate one just for the driftless area. So depending on where you're working, you can pull up a, a list that is pre-baked for your part of the state. And I can send these direct links to Andy if that would be helpful. Okay, I got to keep going, but if we have um, questions at the end, we can come back to this list of climate impacts, okay? So what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to work with landowners? What does this mean for our jobs? Uh, how do we cope with climate change? And in a word, uh, our, our choice is to adapt. Um, we have to figure out how to cope with this and prepare for it. Um, and when I talk about adaptation, I use a really you know, broad definition of that term. Any action you can take to prepare for climate change, that is adaptation. Um, and we add a, a wrinkle to this. Um, we think adaptation should still be about meeting your goals or meeting the goals of your landowners. Um, <clears throat> and we'll talk about that uh, as, as we go on here. Um, a couple of the uh, uh, a couple of the tools that we have in our toolkit for climate change adaptation are number one um, the knowledge and experience that foresters already have working in an area. So the the information we have on climate change, the best we can do is to talk about very broad trends, right? So I can show you those maps of range changes for individual tree species. I can talk about temperature or precipitation projections, um, but that's all painting with a really broad brush. We know there's going to be local scale variation in the outcomes of climate change. And, and you all are already trained to think about these site conditions that could either increase or decrease the risk of climate change. Um, so th things like uh, you know, soils, hydrology, existing forest health issues, past management, um, tree species composition. All of those things you're already used to considering uh, when you walk and talk with a landowner. Well, those same factors are going to help you determine, am I in a high risk or a low risk area uh, when it comes to climate change? The other thing we have on our side um, is that we can make decisions about priorities. Uh, we know that climate change is going to throw us some surprises and we're not going to be able to get everything we want out of the woods. Um, but we do know what we value. And so if we're listening to landowners uh, and really hearing from them what they, what they value most, then we can kind of use that as our North Star for climate change adaptation and figure out well, how can we help them continue to achieve A, B, or C, even though we may have to give up a little bit on D and E? Um, so having that conversation can help us uh, really clarify our goals for climate adaptation. And it's important to recognize you have a range of options when it comes to adapting to climate change. It doesn't mean one thing everywhere all the time. We talk about three general pathways for responding to climate change. Uh, and you see them here, resistance, resilience, and transition. These are three slightly different ideas um, uh, or pathways you could take into the future. Uh, resistance is this idea of playing defense and trying to maintain status quo as long as possible. And so I use this image of building up the seawall uh, 
around New York City, right? That is very valuable real estate. We've got a lot invested there. A lot of people live there. So we're not just going to abandon that land even as the seas are rising. We're going to do what we can to hold that ground for a while. And this might make sense for you or your landowners if you're in a place with you know, a high economic value or a strong value for an endangered species or something like that. Resilience is this idea um, of trying to encourage flexibility uh, and elasticity. So a rubber band is resilient because it can stretch. It can take change and then rebound on its own. And so there's a lot of things we can do in forests to encourage resilience. Things like managing for a variety of species and a variety of age classes are perfect adaptation strategies for this resilience pathway because you're basically giving that forest many potential chances to reorganize and perpetuate itself. And transition is this idea that we can encourage a change that's going to reduce long-term risks. Um, and so I, I showed that example of white oak uh, earlier. So if you are in a, an area in northern Wisconsin that might be suitable for white oak, well, a transition idea is to start to get ahead of the curve and experiment with some planting uh, of that species or others that you think might thrive there in the future if it's going to provide some value like a hard mast species for wildlife that the landowner cares about. <clears throat> um, I think Andy has distributed uh, a, a tool, uh, a new guide that um, I hope will be useful to you and your landowners to con continue thinking about climate change and having these discussions. Um, the challenge is that there's way more information that we could ever keep up with, uh, more and more being written all the time about climate change and forest impacts. And like I mentioned, a lot of what you read is talking about really broad trends and generalizations, and it's kind of far away from management decisions. Uh, this field guide uh, that NIAX and our partners produced hopefully addresses that. Number one, we're trying to provide a really tidy synthesis, a really short summary uh, of essential climate change information. Um, and so it really does fit in your pocket. That was the goal. Uh, what we provide is basically a top 10 list of climate change impacts. Um, so these are reminders to you. They're things to talk about with your landowners uh, or your clients. So what are you know most important climate change impacts uh, to consider? For each forest type, uh, in northern Wisconsin, we have a, a short summary that talks a little bit about what that forest type is, uh, what it needs to thrive, what was our assessment of climate change vulnerability and some of the key climate impacts, um, tree species projections for trees that are found in that forest type. Uh, so you get some summary information, uh, hopefully in a a really useful format here. And the other thing we talked about is, you know, the need to consider local factors. Um, and the way we try to get around that, or the way we try to help you with that, is to provide kind of a checklist of site considerations that could either increase or decrease the risk from climate change. Uh, and so for each forest type, you get a checklist page like this with some examples of conditions that could increase risk from climate change or conditions that could decrease the risk from climate change. And this can be a clue to you. You know, if you start to add these up, am I in low risk or high risk situations, then that can start to tell you whether I'm in a situation where we look like we already have a lot of risk, so maybe it's worth it to try some new and different things, or I'm in a site that doesn't seem like it's in a lot of risk. Maybe I can continue pushing resilience uh, or resistance uh, and keep this site healthy for the long term. So hopefully that can be a useful guide for you and start the discussion. Um, I'm going to skip this 
And Andy, I'm going to move over to you now. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks, Stephen. Um, so I kind of wanted to uh, move into maybe a little bit how um, NRCS programs can uh, assist um, the different um, professionals out there and landowners to kind of move and use the, the information that Stephen has kind of provided and actually apply it on the ground. I think Stephen started out when I first met him that he said something like uh, that NRCS and the county lands folks are basically the tip of the spear and that for climate change and that we're going to have an opportunity to sort of um, influence some of that change. Um, I just want to make a note about um, we created it for NRCS with uh, the help of uh, NIAC, um, a number of brochures. And um, I was at my first meeting with that brochure uh, this past weekend. And it was actually amazing the amount of people that picked up that brochure. I think I bought about 40 and they were all gone uh, in the first uh, day and a half of, the, of a two day meeting. So I thought that was pretty amazing because usually I don't get a lot of responses from landowners. Um, this, showed me that uh, there's actually a lot of interest uh, with that. Um, and we also, if uh, people want, I can get them brochures. We have them on forestry, wildlife, and wetlands. So it's taking the information that NIAC has and it is putting it in the form of what are NRCS practices or enhancements that can be uh, used for financial assistance on the ground. Um, I did send out a USDA hardiness zone change to the NRCS uh, staff, and I kind of will continue to send out, I have a weekly eco-sciences uh, bulletin, and I'll send those out, um, you know, sp sporadically throughout the year, because I know that everybody doesn't have a chance to read all the information that gets out there. Um, next, and lastly, before I start, like the slides is really, um, we're looking for uh, flexibility for tree species, um, and, so we use a couple of different uh, sources to determine whether a tree is native to a county. And we're being flexible here at the state office that if we utilize the tools of NIAC that NIAC has, and I would work with whoever you know wants to try doing stuff like this, and we've done a few already, that we are willing to uh, be able to allow some of these species where it's um, you know using the these workbooks and things like that to be able to determine um, yeah this species is moving into that county or would be adaptable to that county um, we're not looking at doing 100 percent type plantings but we're willing to take a little bit of risk and put in a percentage of those plants but a lot of it depends on the uh, local person and working with the dnr or other forestry professionals um, to determine that so i'm going to kind of just talk about some of the uh the, the program basics uh, and uh, what they might offer that would best be suited for this, um, for climate adaptation. Let me put the slide, Stephen. So one of the ones is um, forest and improvement. Um, that's just promoting op optimal growth, um, favoring particular species like in a pre-commercial thin. Uh, you can promote those species that are more adaptive to the site. Um, obviously, you're working with a landowner to determine um, landowner objectives, but forest and improvement has a number of things, basically to keep the uh, forest healthy and resilient uh, through thinnings and uh, regeneration methods. And one of the biggest things that we can be kind of looking towards, as Stephen pointed out, was getting into um, going from even age to uneven age management. Uh, because certain issues uh, affect trees at different ages. And so when you split up the age, the, the uh, age differences, there's a lot more resilience built into the forest. Um, and this is all in the EQIP program, I'm sorry, the Environmental Quality um, Incentive Program. And the other, probably what I feel is one of the most important ones is the tree and shrub planting. I think people have seen, uh, I think in the last six months, uh, basically trees will save the world. Um, so we want to look at how we can use these tree and shrub plantings uh, to best to best help our uh, clients um, adapt or use the three different methods that um, uh, Stephen was talking about for adapting to climate change. Let's see. Um, some of the other equip practice standards that we do have that I'll, that will come into play with this is uh, woody residue treatment. Um, this is because the influx, uh, a lot of it is for the influx of EAB and the storm events tend to um, 
create like the uh, the storm up north, uh, 400,000 acres of storm damage, um, tree and shrub site prep. We do wind breaks, uh, increasing your riparian forest buffers, uh, brush management, and herbaceous weed control. I think that's going to be a big player in these upcoming years as the, as uh, invasive species and, and things like that start moving on, well, typically moving north. Um, the other program that we have is the uh, CSP program. And if we could flip back to that. Nope, one down, sorry. Next one. Uh, okay, so there's actually specific, um, so CSP, the Conservation Stewardship Program, is a five-year program, but there are specific enhancements that are, are designed to work with climate adaptation. For example, one of the enhancements that NRCS offers is planting for carbon sequestration. Um, in this, we're looking for trees that are fast growing because they sequester carbon, but we're also kind of putting in combination with uh, longer lived species so that it holds carbon, which is another enhancement is actually carbon storage uh, enhancement. It's basically setting aside part of your property and extending past the normal rotations or determining that you may not actually cut and you may leave that. Um, in California, we'd call that going for an old growth look uh, type component. Um, next page. So the other CSP enhancements um, I think the biggest thing that we think about down in the southern part of the state is the stormwater and runoff reduction. And I, I put a little diagram here just showing um, the different uh, benefits to trees. And this one in particular I took because of the stormwater runoff re reduction. Um, we're looking at things um, improving field borders, increasing our riparian forest buffers, uh, crop cropland conversions on slopes and marginal cropland. Um, it's the CSP program offers all of the uh, practices that are available in EQIP. Um, what, one of the things that we talked about too in this discussion was about um, species diversity. So in sugar, sugar bush management, we're looking to um, incentivize basically people putting in other species within their sugar bush management to build resilience. Uh, we also are working with facilitating oak regeneration and also increasing diversity in pine plantations. Um, I always think of um, increasing diversity in uh, forests, more like increasing your opportunities as far as like a bank, bank or investment portfolio. You never know when something like uh, EAB is gonna come through and, it, and wipe it all out like it is occurring uh, throughout the state. And so the more, the more diversity that you have, um, the more likelihood that those, those um, bugs that are attacking particular species uh, will pass over your forest, well not necessarily pass over your forest, but it won't be as devastating as, uh, as it could be, as we're seeing basically all around the state with uh, ash as a prime example. So I just wanted to let people know that, that we, do have, um, we do have enhancements in the CSP program and practices in EQIP that we are willing to use and work with uh, the, the, um, some of the workbooks, and the field guides uh, that NIAC has provided. And most of these kind of exceed a lot of our, our NRCS criteria. So the ability to apply them is actually uh, relatively easy. So I, I encourage people to use those things, um, to send me an email if you're looking for uh, brochures for customers on, um, on the different effects that climate change is gonna have in Wisconsin on forestry, wildlife, wetlands, and stuff like that, and and know that um, I'm willing to work with you to um, apply these things on the ground and and make some of this stuff happen. So I'm not sure if people have uh, questions that they'd like to, if they'd like to ask um, about any of these uh, programs, but you can probably follow up with me, with me direct. Here's my email and Stephen Handler, and I I, I communicate with Stephen uh, on a monthly basis minimum. And so um, when you guys have questions that I can't answer or need to get more resources, I can always work with um, Steven to get that for you. But I, uh, I, I think it's a really good idea to utilize these programs, even if a lot of times landowner, that is not their goal is climate change. Um, I think that you know, working these into their plans will be a benefit whether they have interest in that in particular or not. And I think that where, as I found out this past weekend, 
Um, there is a lot more landowners out there that are very interested in this, and there is not a lot of um, uh, different organizations that are at the field level, like NRCS and the counties um, and the DNR, that are actually going to be able to be on the ground and apply this stuff. So uh, thanks for coming to this webinar, and um, I'm not sure if, Stephen, if you had anything to add or if, um, or if there's any questions, now's the chance. I'll be sending out this uh, recorded webinar through um, my Ecosciences Weekly Bulletin, um, and I'll include uh, uh, the slideshow, and at, when, when the video's uh, set to go, I will get that out to all the NRCS employees out there. Great. And do you see Crystal's question there? She would like a little bit more. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay, so I guess the, the short answer is um, we generally expect invasive species to increase with climate change, number one, because stress and disruption in native ecosystems will open up more opportunities for invasive species to fill gaps. So number one is just this idea that when there's change and when there's disturbance, well, there's always a chance that invasive species are going to get a foothold in there. The other idea is that some invasive species are um, ecologically really primed to take advantage of, say, warmer conditions and longer growing seasons that have historically kept them out of places like Wisconsin. Um, and so we just just look to the example of um, buckthorn, uh, and that's a really clear one. And often it's the last thing you see that's green in the forests. Um, and that tells you it's, it's keeping its leaves. It is uniquely positioned to be able to take advantage of a longer growing season. Uh, many of our native plants start to, you know, go dormant and drop their leaves because they're following daylight cues for when fall comes. And so buckthorn has this built-in advantage. It is um, out there uh, accumulating resources and growing while native species may be dormant. And so that's a chance for it really to step on the gas. We don't have a lot of scientific modeling for invasive species. So in, in many cases, we have to kind of use our, um, our ecological training and kind of our, our gut instinct right now. I, <clears throat> I think I'd like to point out too that, uh, that the uh, that NRCS um, and the EQIP program for invasive species for a number of species, including buckthorn, uh, we've started, uh, I think two years ago, we have started using three-year treatments. Um, I, I, I highly recommend people taking advantage of that because it's typically not a one and done type uh, practice where you do it one year and you can expect to conquer the buckthorn. Um, in fact, it's uh, quite a large endeavor, but NRCS sees that and with other invasive species, so it's it's good to take advantage, especially when it's a new outbreak in your area, is to just hammer it. Do we have any other questions? I thank Stephen and Andy for your great presentation. And again, just letting you know that we will post the recording of this webinar on the Wisconsin Land and Water Media website. So last call for more Thanks questions. Thanks for organizing this, Penny. You're welcome. Thank you guys. It was great. It was very informative. And I'm going to say we're going to call it a wrap. So have a great day, everyone. Thank you for attending. Yep. Thanks, Stephen and Penny. Appreciate it. Thanks. Take care, guys. Thanks, Andy.